You're listening to The Dental Guys, The Greg and Bob Show. Greg Kinzer and Bob Winner of Spear Education. Greg Kinzer and Bob Winner join Wes and John to discuss a deep dive into material selection for implant restorations. We learned some interesting things from Tomas Linkovicus in Zero Bone Loss Concepts, and we discussed some of those things in this episode. What about abutment selection for screw retained crowns? Should zirconia be used on the tissue side of your dental implant abutments, or should it be titanium that we've known to be tried and true for years? How important is this subgingival implant material? Well, we find out this week what Greg and Bob think on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. This is Justin Goodbrand, and here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbrand here with Financially Simple. Over the last year, we spent time talking about how to increase the value of your practice. We've looked at planning, leadership, sales and marketing, people and operations, and finally, finance and legal. All of these various components come together to form the value of your practice. But think about this. It is highly probable for similar practices to have the same revenue and the same net income, yet have vastly different sales prices. For example, let's say that your practice has a young, very vibrant workforce who is highly educated, who doesn't plan on retiring in the near future. On the opposite side, a competitor of yours has an older workforce who is much closer to retirement and the team members aren't quite as educated. Which practice appears more valuable? Both could bring in the same revenue streams. But purchasing dentists may have concerns that the aging workforce could soon retire, leaving them to staff an entire office. Value growth focuses on increasing the sales price of your company. If you have questions about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Is it heritageinvestor.com? Financially simple.com for additional information. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, the Dental Guy. And I'm John, the Dental Guy. And uh, we've been uh, we've been waiting for this one for a long time. You know, it seems like every time we get to sit down with these two guys, we never really have enough time. It's almost to- like we. N- we need a reunion, right? Because yes, you're that's right, really John. what it is. We need that's a the reunion. Word. That's, the, that's the right word. When we were out at Spear and uh, covering a, a um, what was the thing? It was a Spear Summit, right? And we yeah. we ran into Greg and Bob at um, mm-hmm. a after uh, evening function, and they were like, "Guys, when are we going to get on the show?" Yeah, and we were like, they "Hadn't gotten a chance you- to do it." together we didn't know you or wanted to come and, on right, right? Yeah. and so and then, you know and then we got was, a chance when we were out at our last workshop <clears throat> to actually get them both on at the same time but we were it was like over lunch we had like 20 minutes it was you barely kind of get into things on a show like this at you know until you're in 10 15 minutes so we're super yeah. excited to uh, bring back onto the show today uh both from spear education dr greg kinzer and dr bob winner welcome guys Hello. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good, good, good morning. Excited. Thank you. Well, we were talking uh, quite a bit as we've spoken to you guys individually over the, the last few weeks on a couple different topics. Um, and we kind of had put together some ideas talking with you guys based on what you guys are um, passionate about um, to try to 
have a show to talk about implant materials, uh, implant restorative material selection. And, and it wasn't just that, it was kind of dovetailing that together <clears throat> with some of the information that, uh, for those of you watching the show, comes from uh, Link of Vicious book, uh, Zero Bone Loss Concepts. And there's some interesting things in there that will maybe kind of fit into the show today. We wanted to kind of get your thoughts on. So let's just kind of dive right in. Uh, for most of you, most people that are watching the show know who you guys are. Um, you, you talk a little bit maybe before we get into the questions about which um, workshops, seminars you guys are, are teaching out there at Spear. So for those who don't know what you do, you can kind of give them a little background on you guys. Yeah, start with Greg. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you again for having us here. Uh, it's always fun. I, I was laughing when you were recalling our conversation at the summit. Uh, because it's actually true that uh, we, our feelings were hurt is really what happened. <laughs> Here you guys are doing it. You got this huge schedule. And, and then it's like, what the hell? Like, wh where were we on your schedule? It was so, so we guilted you into actually having us on your show. We'd, but the counter argument to it was we really weren't, <clears throat> we, at that time, we didn't know you guys very well. And we weren't really sure if you guys wanted to do it, you know, cause some people are like, Oh, the, that, you know, cause I think a lot of people have the, the thought of, well, maybe we're going to ask you about your favorite ice cream or something like that. Uh, so then once we heard you actually wanted to come on, we were like, okay, this is, so it wasn't, it wasn't personal. It was, uh, that sounds like a, a cop out because everybody, every other faculty member was on it except us. So I don't know, <laughs> maybe we got overlooked. So well, that's it why sounds, like you're, sounds like maybe you're too, too shy to approach us. <laughs> maybe that's what it was that's intimidating was. yeah because bob i mean especially bob you're incredibly intimidating right no not at all tell us bob tell us what you do out there at spirit what what are some of the things you're teaching and greg we'll talk about uh, your your workshops and seminars too well i'm involved in quite a few of the uh workshops at spear um spend about 90 days a year uh teaching workshops so that's about 30 workshops uh Everything from uh, preparation design and materials to uh, anterior indirect restorative dentistry, implant restorative dentistry, worn dentition, uh, comprehensive case planning and phase treatment, uh, um, composite workshop. Uh, so uh, quite involved with uh, most of the advanced, if not all the advanced workshops and uh, do recording for online segments. Uh, uh, right for uh, spear and so do do a lot of different things with different hats. Yeah, I'm, I'm Greg pretty Tyler's much talking about yours. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same as Bob. Bob and I do a lot of the advanced workshops together. Uh, I also am in almost every seminar that we do. Uh, the only ones I'm not involved in would be the airway seminar and and the uh, terminal dentition, but everything else, treatment planning, occlusion, worn dentition, interdisciplinary implants, uh, There's those are all, I'm in you know, all of those. And then treatment planning, the, the FGTP treatment planning workshop is the only other one that I'm in that, that Bob isn't in. Uh, but otherwise, we, we enjoy being around each other, Bob and I, uh, even though we were we were trained at different times in different places. We practiced together for mm -hmm. for three years uh, when I first came into practice. And so we see things and think about things in a very similar way. So in the advanced workshop, like when you guys came in, uh, it's fun for us because you you think about things maybe differently than others do. And your, your questions are fun for us. And that's why we kind of look forward to these uh, podcast with you guys because you kind of want to get down and dirty with the nitty gritty of, of, you know, the, the, the nerdy part of dentistry that some people don't really want to talk about that you guys want to go there. So, uh, it's, it's fun yep. for us. Good. Well, good. Yeah. We it's, it's rare fun. that we get to geek out, you know, and, and, and actually it's, it's been kind of cool because as the podcast has evolved, people kind of know that's what we're about. So we, we get to bring people on that are, in that same vein. And it sounds like that's why you guys get, you know, to enjoy hanging out with each other is because you're kind of the same way. So with that in mind, let's begin the geeking out by talking about, uh, abutment selection. And now we've talked to you guys a little bit about this in the past, uh, for sure when we've, we've been on together, but, um, one of the things, you know, I want to kind of maybe again, dovetail it into the book, you know, what, what, one of the things that, uh, Tomas talks about, is how we make um, decisions on the abutment based upon 
um, material in terms of biology as well as, you know, fit and then talking about emergence. And he's a big fan of using titanium bases versus using uh, customized abutments. And, you know, he talks about in the book that some of that is you get an OEM fit. Uh, some of that is to have the ability to have as much polished zirconia against tissue versus having metal. Um, but, you know, early on, we saw some issues, you guys, I'm sure did too, with um, debonding of these, like this, the chimney length was real short. Um, you know, it seems like that's maybe getting better, but talk a little bit about what you guys think there, uh, custom abutments, tie bases for your, you know, for these, especially these screw tain posterior restorations, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on choosing that and uh, biology structure, all that stuff? Well, I, I, so one, just one, let me start, let me start Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, his his book is actually really uh, it's really well put together, and he has written and thinks and has done research on things to the nth degree, um, things that maybe a lot of dentists just kind of take for granted or maybe don't even think about at all. So it's it was very nicely put together in his textbook. Um, you you bring up the good point because you could go. I'm all interested in biology, so that uh, zirconia surface is the most important, and every abutment should be zirconia. But then you have to bring in structure uh, because there are times when zirconia maybe isn't the material because of the position of the implant and the thinness of the zirconia, and then the risk of fracture. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act between if you have an ideal situation, what is your thought process and what are your material selections? And then if you have to back off because one of your parameters isn't correct, um, orientation, inclination, uh, subgingival margin or subosseous position of the implant, now you have to reconsider and you have to kind of go a different direction. So the good thing is that there's a lot of abutment materials that we have to choose from. and the way we would choose then would be based on the factors of what's going to be the kindest to the tissue, what's going to have the, the best fit, what's going to have the best longevity in the mouth with maybe some of the forces that we have to contend with. So it's not just telling your technician, hey, I got an implant, give me an abutment and I'll, I'll just put it in the mouth. There's so many factors involved. Yeah, one additional thought um, is the terminology used to describe um, the custom versus using a tie base. Just keep in mind that everything that you use a tie base with is customized, right? So the connection is the, really the reference that you're referring to rather than, a, for example, a UCLA type where you can wax and cast onto a, a uh, particular uh, uh, sleeve, and, but yet if you have a tie base, everything above the tie base is customized. And with the evolution of tie bases, you have different, um, not only heights of chimneys today, but also collar heights, uh, depending on the position of the implant relative to the height of the top soft tissue. So in my opinion, they're all customized uh, uh, concepts. So, so, to, so to get back into your discussion, uh, Manufacturers have helped us. Uh, they've learned through us, clinician. I'm talking clinicians now, not us in particular. Uh, but but you mentioned that the initial tie bases um, we had failures. We had D bonds uh, because the height of the tie base wasn't wasn't ideal. The chimney height. We had problems of seating some of these because the flare of the tie base came off too quick. And if the head of the fixture was a little bit below the osseous crest, you couldn't get it down. Or if you wanted to get it down and you polished off the, the flare of the tie base, now structurally you have a weaker restoration. Uh, so manufacturers have helped us because now we have, um, we have different heights, gingival heights before the flare starts. We have different chimney heights that we can choose from. So we have a better selection now than we've ever had to be able to use a tie base and then again to have a, a tight uh, zirconia uh, piece that's customized, as Bob said, on top of that. So do you think knowing what we know about the, um, first off, the, the biology side um, with having Matt, do you feel like 
you agree with the idea <clears throat> of maximizing the amount of zirconia, you know, by using a tie base to maximize the amount of zirconia, letting the, the crown be, do the emergence, if you will, versus, you know, increasing the amount of metal. Because it used to be the thought was we needed that metal to support our, our porcelain, right? In order to have strength back when we were more doing more layering. Um, do you think that you would favor a tie base over a custom abutment for, say, a posterior screw retain restoration, knowing what we know now and that with all the variability of the sizes and shapes we have? Well, your first decision would be if you want to go metal free and you want to go to zirconia as opposed to titanium. Um, you know, some of the research shows that maybe the best material <laughs> subgingival is zirconia. Um, and then different degrees of polish comes into play, but you can find some literature to support. You still need some micro scratches in that zirconia to help gain adherence of the, the cells. So um, I'm sure who that is. About that guys no worries <laughs> no worries greg when you're so chasing, guy, bob yeah i'll paul i can i can mute i can mute bob for a minute if you need to take a call <laughs> um, <laughs> i mean that's the greatest thing about live stream is we you know it just it's, it's whatever just happens like, happens whatever happens yeah, yeah, happens right. so you were saying that you know the degree of polish all comes into play i think what we realized and let me go back to my four shot here we realized when reading this book um, and, and I don't want to spend so much time on what he says in the book, but there is literature now that's starting to support that some of the best subgingival materials uh, are leaning towards this idea of creating the emergence in the crown with the zirconia. The issue that I took with, from this in the book was the amount of of technical capability that your technician has to have to be able to pull this off because there is a lot of protocols in what some of the literature is asking for to achieve some of this tissue adherence. So mm -hmm. Greg, you said it, you said it first, whenever we went to you first there early, you said you have to kind of decide, maybe you didn't say it like this, but maybe I'm going to put words in your mouth. You have to decide what camp you're in. Are you in the camp that you're going to stick with what we know is strong, which is an emergence of titanium creating a full contour situation with a custom abutment? Or are you going to go back to some of these new, newer tie bases that have proper emergence, don't have so much of a flare, can avoid the subcrestal uh, issues of placement of a tie base because of their chimneys now are being custom made from the manufacturers? and you're going to use the zirconia, what camp do you lie in? And I guess for our listeners that I want to ask this is I think it's important to stress good protocols in the most ideal situation, right? Mm -hmm. What am I going to tell my new budding <laughs> dentist? Hey, single posterior molar implant, number 19, number 30, number three and 14. This is what we're going to do in our office because it is tried and true. And I, I want us to talk a little bit about that because I feel like there is two camps right now, but you got to have some high level technicians that can pull off this mm -hmm. zirconia. Well, I, okay. So I'm going to go back to Bob's statement earlier um, because it seems like our verbiage is going back and forth. Y you can live in both camps. Um, I don't believe in an ideal situation. There are two camps. It's, it's one and the same. Uh, a tie base can have a customized abutment profile on it. The only thing that's not customizable is the initial uh, height, gingival height before the flare starts and the flare itself. But then everything that sits above that is actually customized for your patient. And you said it's not the, it's not the crown that's creating that emergence. You can picture so so let's let's just say for a posterior we're going to go screw retain that's the literature would be very clear that screw retain posterior implant crowns would be the preference um, because of contacts opening and because of residual cement that being said when you talk about cell adherence uh the biology aspect 
the preferential material would be zirconia subgingival, not a poly, not a glazed uh, ceramic, not a, a layered ceramic. That being said, you can have that, and then on top of it, you could have a crown that is made as two pieces. So imagine you have your abutment that's got uh, your tie base, it's got your zirconia, and then you have a crown that sits on top of that with the hole in it that you bond together. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds. Uh, you can have ideal fit, you can have ideal interaction with the biology, and then you get whatever aesthetics you want by whatever material you're going to have as the crown, all made and finally cemented as one big piece. Um, so I don't think, I mean, Bob can talk about the, the lab side of it. I don't think you need special technicians. I think uh, a, a well-trained technician is able to do this. Good. So, yeah, let me build on those thoughts because um, if you think about the ideal, which is what we try and think about and what we try and teach, even posteriorly, you've guided the soft tissue with a custom healing abutment or maybe even a, a provisional. And therefore, the work of the technician is copying what the clinician has created with the soft tissue profile. The unfortunate part is most clinicians don't take the time to manage the soft tissue posteriorly. And therefore, the technician, then the technician has to try and manage it on your own, their own. And therefore, the skill and understanding of the technician comes more into play. Um, but I like the way Greg describes it because our preference is to think of always an abutment. What happens subgingival is the abutment. What happens above the free gingival margin is the crown. Sometimes they're made in one piece, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking about milling zirconia, um, absolutely and you cement that onto a tie base. The other option is you make a traditional abutment that has a prep that sticks above the tissue and an individual crown, as Greg described, with a hole in it. That might be, in fact, it's my preference anterior or posteriorly because I can manage things um, as if it's, uh, yeah. if I put the abutment in, now I almost treat it as if it's a tooth. I can try in my crown, check the proximal contact, check the occlusion, check the aesthetics. If the aesthetics isn't right, I can refire it. I can stain it. I have options. But if it's in one piece, and in this country, most people that make it in one piece have the laboratory cement the components together in the laboratory. And therefore, there is no recovery. If you uh, put it in the mouth and you have a loose contact, there's no way to add ceramic to it because you can't take out the tie base. Where in Europe, the, the standard would be is use some type of um, temporary material or something to connect the tie base to the, to the subgingival restorative form, I'll call it the abutment, try it in the mouth. And then my question to them is, how do you get the parts, uh, get the pieces apart. And they say, well, you can put it in a furnace and, and heat it up and, and then soften the cement and take it out. And I said, well, the problem with that is you oxidize the titanium when you do that. Mm -hmm. And therefore that can negatively in, uh, affect the fit. And now you have an oxidized surface as opposed to the polished surface. So mm -hmm. there's honestly, at this point in my belief, there's no absolute protocol that 100% of us are following because we don't have all the answers. Um, and that actually is frustrating for us because as a, as a teacher, we're trying to provide the best answers for everyone in their daily life. But I'm not sure if we have 100% of those answers. And, and what you said right there is exactly why we're having this conversation. Because I don't know yeah. how many times that through even just our podcast that we get the question of what are you guys going to use in the posterior for your single units? What are you going to use in the anterior? And I like yeah. the idea. I think you gave a little bit. You opened the keys to the kingdom just a little bit there, Bob, <laughs> and in how you manage your clinical abutments and your crowns. It gives you the greatest um ability whenever you can try a crown in aesthetically 
on an abutment right. that's white, right? And work from there on your contacts, your contours, yep. and all those things. Yeah, everybody knows how much fun it is to adjust contacts on adjacent implant crowns that are one piece yeah. screw retained. It just it just sucks, you know. It and having all even, that even availability. Just the same unit. Yeah, implant. Just it's one unit, exactly. One piece. It's 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 going to take a ton of clinic time. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, so the, the challenge the challenge is when you're screwing it in because of the Morris taper that's on most implant abutment designs, you can't tell if it's 100% seated. You can't take a radiograph and say, well, that's absolutely mm -hmm. down. I have flat surfaces fitting together, right? So yeah. uh, you don't know if it's a contact that's tight or if it's actually the, the abutment is tight into the implant. So taking some of those uh, variables out of the equation, I think increases predictability um, of yeah. achieving the best outcome initially. Well, plus it has the, the coolest name, right? Screw menable. I mean, that's just a word that we need to be using more frequently, I think. I mean, that's just, you can't get any better than that. So let me ask the question to you, Bob. You mentioned that a lot of clinicians don't manage the tissue through to the point of uh, passing that information to the laboratory so that the laboratory has the ability to simply copy the design. And we know there are many methods to manage that that we, we won't dive into because it's a whole different discussion. But let's talk about the typical, which is that labs aren't getting that information. Um, when it comes to trying to determine, say, what tie base cuff height you're going to choose or how you're going to develop the emergence um, what do you think we should be doing? Because we, you know, for instance, you know, we send radiographs along with our impressions so we can show, uh, where the bone is at least and somewhat where the tissue is. The more that we're getting into this paradigm of subcrustal implant placement, thinking about soft tissue thickness, we're placing our implants deeper and deeper. Um, what are some, some things that we can be doing to communicate to our lab technicians about how to make the choices of what cuff height to choose or how to develop that emergence uh, if we haven't worked the tissue out uh, in a provisional? Yeah, a uh, great discussion and a great question. Um, my first comment would be how many technicians have been trained to read radiographs? And right. I think the answer to that is is almost none. The higher the level a technician uh, and the closer collaboration with the clinician, um, you can help um, the technician understanding in that. You know, I've been involved in, uh, I'll say, commercial laboratories uh, most of my career. And uh, late last year, Greg and I opened up a new uh, laboratory um, that it's, in my opinion, it's really fun to to be involved in that because we take what we teach from an educational perspective and then we see the reality of what happens uh, in daily practices. And so um, we have the ability to work with a lot of talented people that are passionate and doing the best outcome. And yet when you look at single unit posteriors, time is money and everyone's trying to survive in clinical practice being efficient and therefore one step that's commonly skipped is managing the soft tissue. So it puts more pressure on the technician to make some decisions on how to uh, make uh, decisions on where you place the collar and transitions and how much pressure to put on the tissue. And my comment is going to be maybe a little bit vague, but in reality, it now becomes case dependent and client dependent. Certain clients will have preferences, meaning that um, if they haven't managed the tissue, let's say one client prefers a, a straight pedestal rising up close to the emergence of the soft tissue, and then they have this big crown sitting on top of the ridge. So therefore, when they insert it, there's no pressure on the tissue. That could be one preference, and the laboratory needs to know for that client, that's the preference. Another client may say, well, 
two millimeters of gingival start diverging this, uh, developing this flare, and I'm okay with a little pressure, but what's a little pressure, right? So <laughs> it's a, it becomes a trial and error, and that's where, honestly, I think the frustration um, comes into play from a clinical perspective, because if, if there is too much pressure and you can't get the restoration seated, it's incredibly frustrating and time consuming and that maybe soft tissue pressure is preventing the proper engagement and seating and it's going to affect the occlusion and contacts. So the more we clinically skip steps, the, the harder the insertion process becomes. So, um, technicians, I think have to, um, interact almost client by client and establish their preferences if they are not going to manage soft tissue intraorally because there's so many options. So Greg, what yeah, are you doing clinically? Well, I, I, so let me just build on what Bob said and then I'll, I'll address that. Um, the, the challenge that clinicians have is they, there's always a love hate relationship with your technicians. Right. So if your experience when you get your implant crown back is I can't get it seated because there's too much pressure, uh, you might choose to move on into a different lab and you would put the blame on the technician for what they did. Mm -hmm. In reality, the onus should be on the clinician. Uh, they're only able to do on the lab bench what you've given them and the information that you've given them. So in the ideal world, um, the restorative dentist's role is managing the soft tissue on the implant restorations. So at some point along in the process, you, you would either shape the soft tissue by provisional, provisionalizing it, shape it with a uh, custom healer, custom healing abutment, a customizable healing abutment, do something to start the emergence profile or even make the emergence profile ideal. Uh, the more information that you can do and give the technician, the easier their job is going to be. If you're choosing not to, and you're choosing to put all of that onto the technician themselves, uh, now, as Bob said, that relationship is you need to understand, they need to understand what you want, and they need to understand how to, how to get that to you. Mm -hmm. And you really can't, in the end, mm. blame them. Uh, and I think that's something that we, gosh, keep re and re and reiterating that we can only expect back from the laboratory what we guide them to give us. And I know it's not maybe as popular in the world of fast paced dentistry to work through a posterior implant provisionalization or even just customizable abutment, but you know, again, we, without diving too deeply into those things, there's a lot of options today. Um, especially if you're, uh, if you're placing your own implants, it becomes a little easier. If you're working closely with the surgeon and the surgeon's willing to do just a few things differently. Um, if you have CAD cam in your office, there's a lot of ways that we can start developing that early. And of course, you know, in the anterior, you'd be silly not to do it every single time in the posterior, the communication is is critical and uh, so when when we talk about this this tie base issue this is going to get this is a to we didn't put this in the in the question in the show before but we were at AAFP American Academy of Fixed Pros and it just this occurred to me so Ronnie we're talking to Ronnie Young from yeah. Zurich and he he said something that we had never heard before and I just want to maybe get your take on it because it could be completely off he's just there's he goes you know what we're studying and you know he's very intense he's like you know what we're studying He's like, tie bases are completely unproven. And we were like, what? We and he said the idea yeah. of cementing a crown extra orally onto a titanium base or a custom abutment, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. He's like, what's going on at that cement junction mm -hmm. in the mouth? He's like, because we're so anti-cement, but then we're cementing these things. And he's like, we're worried about that. Are you guys worried about that at all? Do you think there's anything to show that we should be concerned about extra orally cementing these things and putting them in? Uh, have you seen any data on that? Or is this just something that maybe is nitpicky? Well, I think the point is um, too often times in, in dentistry, um, we do things without any um, real research. And um, I recently heard... Uh, young speak and I heard him talking about this 
And um, I think he maybe has some valid concerns, right? Um, we're doing things just because um, it has driven the cost down compared to, for example, a UCLA concept. And that's been around since the 80s. And yes, we know today that we try to avoid casting alloy because maybe it can corrode. And if you have a, a fired ceramic on it and it's subgingival, it tends to be rougher and more porous. And it's not great for um, not only um, uh, adhesion, adhesion of the cells, but also plaque retention. So we're looking at because of CAD CAM technology, ways to customize the subgenual form and to get away from a, a zirconia connection to the implant, which we know has a high risk of failure. Now a titanium transition makes common sense. But yet, yeah, we don't have any real long-term <laughs> clinical data to say this is the right thing to do. And yeah, I, I hate to say this, but if you take a pessimistic view and you look at five years from now or 10 years from now, if 90% of these things fail, we have a real problem, right? Is that <laughs> yeah. going to occur? Is that going to occur? I don't know. I mean, I, I would love to believe it's not going to. But if you look at the original designs in some current designs on some systems where the, the chimney uh, in one system in particular is maybe a millimeter and a half tall and you rely on the screw to diverge the metal components so you don't rely on cement, um, it's almost going back to the original Brandmark design where you have the external heck that's extremely small and you rely on the screw to hold things together and we realize maybe that's not the best thing to do today. So mm -hmm. the taller the chimney, the better, but now if the point is we have a cement um, layer that could be closer to bone, right? Depending on where your flares and so forth. And is that a concern? Um, we don't know. And I think that's where Young is just trying to say, we don't have the answers. And as a research person, I think that's an honest um, appraisal of the situation. We don't have the answers. So one of my favorite statements is you have to go into things eyes wide open. You know, if there are problems, maybe um, we can't blame someone else. We have to always look at ourselves first. And maybe we shouldn't be doing things if we don't have the research to support what we we want long term. Greg, any follow up on that? Well, I, I think he's I think that Young has a good point, um, because if you just look at the evolution just of a, a tie based concept, we had problems. Right. And there was a response from manufacturers. So. We go into it thinking that we have knowledge and we use them and all of a sudden the tie bases are too short. The flare comes off too, too shallow. And so we end up having problems. Those are immediate type problems, right? They happened within the first year, maybe, uh, maybe even sooner. And I think what Young is talking about now is we don't have long-term data on this. We've fixed some of the structural issues that we saw, but we don't know what's going to happen long term. And he's absolutely correct. Um, I mean, time will tell. The only way to to see what's going to happen is just to start watching because there's so many of these probably the go to material in restoration choice now to do these tie bases, because as Bob said, it it does keep costs down, which has always been a challenge in the implant world is that costs yeah. are raised for the patient. And so uh, either the clinician loses out because of the additional laboratory fees. Uh, so it's it'll be interesting to see. I mean, hopefully what we're doing has validity and we'll still maintain health and structural stability over time, but it just, it isn't there yet. Right. Cause like it's either that or going back to like a one piece mill right. zirconia, uh, you know, connection to the implant, which as Bob just said, it doesn't make us feel great either. Uh, but that was almost what young was kind of pushing toward. He said, I'd rather have that. He made that statement. Now, again, I think he was being a little provocative, yeah. But he was, you know, trying to say that that's how little we know. Like, at least we know what a one-piece zirconia uh, connection is and how it kind of works because we have data. So, anyway, interesting topic. And what, yeah. Wes, let's... Yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about single units. And 
I think it's important to kind of move into this next thing, which is multiple unit restorations. And I, I see myself doing more multiple implants. Uh, for instance, say a patient is, they lose 19, 18, 19, and, and 20. And, you know, or maybe they've, you know, they've got a, a situation where it's going to be an, an optimum situation versus placing three implants. Let's place two and bridge. Now in the past, uh, my training back in 2001, 2002, in the early days of my restorative training, I remember, you know, we called them second stages and you had stages of bump on stages of abutments and it started to get into this layering of prosthetics. Today we use what we call multi-unit or transmucosal abutments, which is a stock abutment that goes onto the implant and then this creates a interface that we can restore multiple implants <clears throat> in an arch and have a nice draw or fit, which really gives us the ability and restorative flexibility to do full arch restorations, three, four, five unit prosthetics, and it's a screw retain restoration. Now, the interesting thing is that as we start stacking those things, restorative space becomes a problem. And that's where John and I really started looking at how can we, based on subcrestal implant placement, right, which is where we're at right now most of the time, and these internally connected implants, how can we get away without using the transmucosal? And one of the suggestions in zero bone loss concepts was to use a non-engaging tie base, maybe even keep an engaging tie base on one of the units for restorative flexibility and being able to seat it to have a path of insertion and then cut off the hex on the other one. Is this a feasible thing to move away so we have more vertical dimension to move away from transmutation? And, and not having a secondary tiny screw also, right. I guess, if you move. Yeah, right. what, what do you using guys think one about screw. that approach? Right. Yeah, so a couple of comments on that. When you... Uh, stack as you were describing it, um, in my opinion, the weak link becomes the tiny screw that you're using to connect those different uh, components. So I think you're at a higher risk of failure because of the small screw you're using. Um, but then going to the, the um, uh, non-engaging concepts, again, that's nothing new um, because that's what has been done um, in the infancy of uh, uh, implant dentistry and restoration when you're doing bridges because virtually never are they perfectly parallel. So you would have to go to a non-engaging type uh, concept. So it's new for the tie bases, of course. Uh, some manufacturers make tie bases that are non-engaging. Others uh, don't. And as soon as you touch that tie base and cut off the, the, the hacks, or the timing aspect of it, you void the um, the warranty on that abutment. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple things that come into play, but logistically things have to play out that way in order to do um, bridges because like I said, virtually never are they uh, implants perfectly positioned and you have a common path of draw that you can actually get the components to engage. So um, honestly, I, I like that direction as opposed to stacking abutments and going to the smaller screws. Uh, but it depends on, uh, of course, the clinical situation, but that would be my preference. Absolutely. I, I think there's a place for both of them. Um, and, and in my practice, the way I would, I would think about how to choose one or the other, I mean, the benefit of this abutment is um, you can put it in and you never have to have connection and reconnection. So I don't have to pull it on and off every time I want to do something because I'm working at tissue level as opposed to fixture level. So you have the health of the tissue right there because you don't have it, uh, you know, de detached and reattached. I don't use them a ton um, until I have multiple implants. So multiple meaning I have three or four implants that I start to have to get things to be fitting on them then the multi-base to me starts to make sense. Uh, two implants, you know, three unit bridge, four unit bridge, whatever it might be. I think staying in our traditional realm of, yes, one, 
one hexed engaging and then one non-engaging and being able to stay with our traditional materials. Um, I still have all of that made as, as separate abutments for the same reasons we talked about the screw mentable, but now the additional benefit of doing that is getting passive fit because there's really no tolerance on, on an implant restoration. So if I can get the implant abutments down and then I can try the bridge on, I can bond the components in the mouth. Now I have pure passivity of fit, uh, which is going to be hard to obtain without doing that because of the inaccuracies of stone that sets and materials that are milled or cast or whatever it's going to be. So give me multiple, multiple implants, and then I'll go to the multi-base, but just give me a few implants and have me splint them together. I would still stay with our traditional methods. Now, what do you say to somebody who, who, uh, asks the question or raises a concern, but if you're using a non-engaging, uh, cylinder or non-engaging connection for a bridge, you're not engaging that connection and that stability. Uh, they're concerned about the stability of the joint. Um, do you think that that is an issue uh, at all? The fact that we're, we have these great connections and yet we're not engaging uh, the hex. Is that an issue as far as things like bone stability, micro movement? Is that something that you get at all concerned about? Uh, or is that something that really we go back to our external hex days which we were doing that all the time. And it was the anti-rotation and the, you know, the passivity that we relied on. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I'm not sure if we have the answers because there's so many implants and implant restoration options today, um, staying within a, a brand and <laughs> then going off label. And you look at the precision of fit, but some research will say, that the primarily um, the Morris taper takes the load as opposed to the hex, but the hex gives the timing. And they say that looking at a radiograph, there's a space between the actual implant and the hex. Well, that can't be true in my opinion, because then the timing would be irrelevant because there would be so much slop. So that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Um, but is the Morris taper taking the predominant load? Um, I'm not a scientist. I haven't analyzed it, but it makes sense to me. But there's so many different designs. I, I, I can't generalize on that. Um, so if it's non-engaging, and this is interesting. I just encountered this yesterday, actually, in the laboratory. Um, a client had uh, two Astra implants uh, to do a four unit maxillary anterior bridge. They were 3.6 implants and they were slightly divergent. And now the, the thought is, uh, what? how do you manage that situation? And the, they wanted to go screw retain. There is a screw retain option for that small implant, but the the it's only in titanium not in zirconia and there's no tie base option and uh in order to custom make that you have to have timing on that implant you can't do it non-engaging so mm -hmm. again that creates tons of technical challenges that I mean, we don't have time to discuss, but the more you do in implant dentistry, the more you start realizing all of these complications come into play from a laboratory perspective. So mm -hmm. could you use the engaging part and design it, make it and so forth, and then cut off the hex? Um, so it allows that path of draw to occur. The answer is yes. And that may be the logical solution, but, um, if if some clinicians want to stay within a manufacturer's line of all of their components, and as soon as you cut off the hex, you void the warranty. And if there's a future problem, then what do you do, right? So again, um, reality comes into play when it comes to manufacturing of all these components. When I say manufacturing from a laboratory perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. um, one of the things that's interesting as we're sitting here talking about it, because... I don't think people realize 
until you really start diving in and and restoring multiple cases how important the surgery is because it can impact you just a couple of degrees can impact you yep. and negatively affect and actually cause what Bob was actually just talking about um, Astra implants have a Morse taper. It's 11 degree internal taper. And John, we actually deal with an implant that even has a steeper, right? Internal yeah. connection. And just those things, understanding <clears throat> those things as, as a restorative dentist and communicating that to the surgeon that this well, it's has even, to be. It's even changed for Wes and I. We've, we had this discussion about a year ago because we were using this really nice, super tight connection Morse taper implant. But if we were doing multiple units, we're like, we, we don't want to use it anymore because it's a problem uh, once you get into multiple units of having to use multi-unit abutments. And that's fine to use them, like Greg said. I mean, they, they have their place. But if now you're, now you're adding cost, you're adding height and vertical issues, you have more components you're messing with. And yeah, this altered screw tiny screws. access, so we, altered screw yeah, channel so we, that he's talking about, John, it's, it's, it's cool. It's cool, right? But there's a well, lot but of little intricacies. JPD paper, just uh, altered screw channel access. You get eighty percent fractures, right? Happening in, once you go over, I think it was what twenty degrees or something. Mm -hmm. So I think that we we told our surgeon, hey, uh, if we're doing multi unit multiple units, I, I'd almost rather have X hex, you know, uh, not not necessarily X hex, but more more freedom, so mm -hmm. that we're not hemmed in by these great implants but they kind of sometimes uh, hurt us a little bit. Uh, let's, let's change, because man, this, this is awesome stuff. Let's change so topics good. again we're, into... Uh, let, me just add, let me just add one thing, uh, because we begin each of uh, the implant workshop and the implant seminar, and we begin them talking about implant positioning. And I always think, man, we're really, uh, we shouldn't be doing this. This is like so freaking basic that why am I spending time with the positioning of implants? And the reality is, you guys said it, it is it is probably one of the most important things because it will, just being off a touch, will dramatically change our ability uh, and the ease of which we're able to make the restoration. It'll change material selection. Um, it'll change design characteristics. It'll change from cementable to screw retained and vice versa. It is so important about the implant position, but I think a lot of People just go, well, yeah, we got that. I, I can get it. I can get it close for you. Um, mm. But it's, it's, it makes our life really rough. So we it still, does, yeah. we start every workshop and seminar the same way. And I'm always in the back of my mind. They're thinking, the students in the audience are looking at me going, really? Like, we're going to really talk about that? Um, But I can't tell you how many times. And again, I'm, I'm, you could say if you're not a trained specialist and you're placing implants, maybe you should really pay attention. But the reality is, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the, the statement I would make. I see, I see implants coming back from trained surgeons that I have significant problems with yeah. because yeah. They, they've got it already. So it's really an important aspect. I mean, that's not our aim here because we're Bob and I aren't surgeons. Uh, but it is a, an important piece that, uh, that should always be discussed. Yeah. And the surgeons often don't see these struggles that we're talking about ever. You know, they just don't, they just don't understand, uh, oftentimes what we're dealing with. I think that's, I think it's easy to criticize, say, genists that get into placing their own implants from a surgeon standpoint, because you're thinking maybe it's a territory issue. And sometimes it is, and there's some legitimacy mm -hmm. you got to be doing it right. But I think there's also some people that go, man, like I just, I got to do it because I got to have more control because I'm running into so many problems. And, and, uh, I don't think there's some legitimacy to that too. And it is interesting. I still find it so interesting that the better our implant connections get, it's like the more problems we kind of have, uh, you know, with, uh, with some of these things and the deeper we're putting our implants in because we're understanding things adds another layer of one degree off two millimeters deeper becomes so many more degrees off as you extrapolate that angle. So one question comes up a lot when we're talking to, uh, when we're talking or teaching or whatever is the challenging case of small abutments in an aesthetic area when we don't have either because of non-ideal implant placement uh, to facial oftentimes or uh, because of just small restorative space, we end up using 
a small abutment because of uh, the, the space uh, issue. And the question of material selection, in these cases, when we have, say, let's choose a maxillary lateral incisor, which is a common uh, area we're working in, um, and we have a small space to begin with, we often have, you know, the, the, as we sometimes say, you know, the devil horn shaped abutment, you know, where the entire middle of the abutment has been carved out to make room for the screw. Um, we get to where we're oftentimes looking for high translucency in our final restoration in these cases. Uh, talk through um, how you guys decide what material mm-hmm. choice you would go with there. You know, do we take the chance on zirconia and some of these thin, small abutments? Uh, selections. Do we look at opaquing titanium? Uh, do we look at? Do we drop back to PFM? You know, what are we thinking about here uh, in selection? Uh, Greg, maybe start with you, and then we can talk about Bob and talk about from the lab standpoint as well. I think the the first thing we need to realize is when we get into these smaller diameter fixtures, um, options are pulled off the table without even we can. It's not even a choice anymore. I think a lot of these smaller implants, uh, they don't have zirconia as an option because the zirconia is going to be too thin and it's going to be come too weak. So then going back to the implant positioning, that's paramount now. It's it's even more important for the implant to be positioned correctly in those situations. But if you pull then zirconia off the table, now you go, what do you have left? Uh, the example that you gave is we have a translucent uh, situation. Well, if we have translucency, then zirconia gives us a nice aesthetics and strength. But if we can't do zirconia, what else do we have? Um, I think you then have to go back into a, a, either a UCLA option, or we can still buy we can buy stock titanium components and use them as a tie base. Because again, a lot of these don't have tie bases either. So we could go with a stock titanium abutment that you would buy out of the catalog. And then you could customize something that goes on top of that. So the stock piece becomes your tie base. And then you could use zirconia and then bond those pieces together, either as a cemented crown or a, a screw retained crown. So I think that's kind of the the position that we have to go to when we start losing some of these other options. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I think uh, Greg covered that nicely. Um, it, it's hard to generalize. Uh, it's case dependent, uh, implant position dependent, and then um, you know the trying to evaluate the space requirements for strength and durability, not just for aesthetics. Aesthetics is always the icing on the cake. So you always want to have a situation that you have a, I would add a predictable long-term outcome. And that means in the mouth 20, 30 years, let's say. Um, So you don't want to compromise strength of that substructure or the abutment. Um, And this is the challenge that we face in, the real world dentistry, we may not have those answers. In fact, traditionally, we don't have those answers until we have the final impression that is in the laboratory. We have the Mm -hmm. final master cast, and then the decisions have to be played out. What are the, what are reasonable options? Um, So it's nice to go into it with a, a really clear plan at the beginning but sometimes we don't have those answers until it gets in the lab. And, and it's a little off topic, but the cost variances can be maybe significant depending on what option you have to go to. And that's where I think most clinicians have to be thinking about that um, in treatment planning and discussing um, outcomes you know, with the patient and fees associated with the case. And you may have to give a range of fees for um, the, re- the laboratory side of things because we don't know if it's got to be a UCLA or can we go to just uh, maybe an option of all zirconia stock abutment that's shaped or modified, right? So there's, we don't necessarily have all those answers until the, the time of fabrication of the restoration. So, you know, kind of in summation here, we've talked a lot about 
you know, just abutment selection. And I think if you're listening to this and you're thinking, whoa, there's more to implant dentistry than just putting a piece of titanium in somebody's jawbone and taking an impression. <laughs> and one of the things that I think that I began to appreciate, and it wasn't probably until I was into practice and had done this long enough, was that first I recognized that taking an impression for a dental implant restoration was maybe one of the easiest things that I did in my day-to-day -day routine. But what I didn't really appreciate until I had actually seen enough and done enough was how complex it becomes the more you involve implants in your practice. And people ask us, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say this all the time as we close out the show, is if you're wanting to get into dental implants, my advice and John's advice has been all along, and I want to ask Greg and Bob their advice. My advice and John's advice has to do with if you want to start placing implants or even restoring implants before you even place, you need to understand restorative componentry and systems. And you have mm -hmm. to actually be a doctor, right? Because sometimes I feel like that we're not the doctor and I'm, I'm just, I'm be a little hard on us and we rely on other people, the lab tech to share their knowledge. And I, uh, there's some great lab techs. We have one that we use that knows so much more than we know about certain things and they help us, but it's our turn to kind of step up. And if I, my advice would be, mm -hmm. you're wanting to learn more, go out and get an amazing amount of restorative knowledge when it comes to dental implants before you just dive into it. Yeah. And Red that's and what you guys are doing out there at Spear. I mean, talk about that, you know, as far as what you guys are, are teaching and kind of along those lines, you know, what, what the, the value of the restorative understanding for obviously the restorative clinician, but also for the surgeons, because I know, I know you guys teach a lot of surgeons out there too, about restorative techniques. So one of the things that I, always take from my surgeon. So Jim Janikiewski is a periodontist here in the Northwest that I work with and, and Bob works with as well. And when he was actually a uh, full-time faculty at the Perio uh, grad program at Washington, he would walk in and the grad students would all want to be, you know, just chomping at the bit to place implants. And he would give them a, the PROS manual. Here's the PROS restorative manual. They're like, no, 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 we're, we're Perio <laughs> grad students. <laughs> but he would say, you need to understand what you're doing now and how that's going to impact the restorative dentist. And so it's that whole restoratively driven treatment planning aspect. And it really plays out with, with implants. And so in our implant workshop that Bob and I teach at Spear, um, it, we typically always have surgeons in the room with us. There's, you know, two to three surgeons uh, in each class, mainly restorative dentists, but the way it's designed is to get you, as, as you all said, is to get you to think differently about implants. It's not just screwing something on, making an impression, and then here, give it to the lab, and they'll determine it. There's so many more nuances that we as restorative dentists need to take into consideration and own ourselves to make our outcomes better. It takes more time. There's more steps involved. That's why the fees mm -hmm. typically are higher for an implant crown because I have to do more work on the front end if I want the final result to be aesthetically and structurally predictable long term. So we, you know, Bob does the hands-on exercises in that. And there's like, I think 18 exercises, Bob, isn't that correct? Uh, approximately. So it's, there's yeah, a lot so of different things. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we go through a lot of different um, um, techniques uh, to do different things. Uh, and it's the implant restorative workshop. Impressive, I think, to any restorative people in the room, it's all about tissue management. <laughs> so the key is tissue management to do the restorative things. Um, and when the surgeons take the course, because they're doing that predominantly because the expectation is the restorative person wants someone else to manage the tissue, and that becomes the surgeon. So it's not about the crown anymore, you know, whether it's a veneer or a crown on a tooth or a crown on an abutment, the crown's a crown. It's what we're doing managing this, 
the subgingival uh, tissue is the key from a restorative perspective. And that's why we believe so strongly in the aesthetic zone for sure. Uh, we manage soft tissue, but posteriorly, it's equally important. And it may seem like you invest a little bit more time to manage the soft tissue posteriorly, but it solves and prevents lots of problems from the insertion uh, time mm -hmm. and and uh, predictability of that whole process. So a little investment of energy up front pays off in ACEs in the long run. Awesome. And one yep. additional yep. comment about um, Jim Janikowski is one reason he's such a great uh, uh, surgeon, and now we're talking about uh, implants, is he was a general dentist before he uh, went to perio. So he did hmm. live the reality of the restorative side of things. So he's thinking as a restored person, just as a surgeon. So um, yeah. I appreciate Greg's comments about, you know, the surgeons want, you know, how do I place the implant? Well, you have to think about the restorative side because that's ultimately um, where the, the the ball lands, right? Is how we have to manage, uh, manage that. Yeah. yeah. And the truly the most successful, even financially surgeons, I mean, I know that's not what it's all about, but it's interesting that I've ever known have almost always been the ones that understand the restorative to the nth mm. degree, you know, because if you're, if you understand that you're putting things on a silver platter for many of your restorative doctors and you're giving them a such a heads up that they, I mean, they want that. They want more of that. Now, I understand yeah. doesn't get us off the hook as restorative docs. We still need to be driving that. We should be taking more responsibility for that. West and I are such big believers in that. But as a surgeon, if you can set up your restorative doctors by saying, hey, you know, I've just been thinking about this case. I got a couple restorative ideas on this. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, That's you're like going to dominate your ever, area. <laughs> yes. Yes, I wish we had more surgeons that were going out and taking this workshop because that's what helps our so restorative good. docs. The reality is, is that unfortunately, you, and you guys are working on all of this, you know, but you're trying to get everybody up to the higher level. So, you know, this has been a great show. I think we need to come back. I, I, I personally think we definitely need to spend some time more on some subgingival tissue discussion, especially in the posterior. Would love to have you guys back to talk about that. Um, but if you've been listening to this show and you kind of have taken some of this and you thought, man, you know, I've learned some things today. Where can I learn more? Head over to Spear Education, check out what they're doing. Um, and I think you'll find that uh, they're going to offer from a surg surgical and restorative standpoint, the best integration or some of the best integration of those two things together. Um, also go out and check out what we're doing over at the demos and uh, like, subscribe and share. Give us a great review on Apple Podcasts would be amazing. That really helps us to get our message out. So we really appreciate everybody that's listening today, uh, both from the Spear Education side and the Dental Guys side. We look forward to bringing you more great content in the coming weeks. So for Bob and Greg and Wes, I'm John and we are the Dental Guys. 